Okay. So I'll, I'll try to be, do my best to, to, to put it on, on the level. So okay. today uh, I will speak. It's a privilege to be the last speaker. So I'll try to not to take much time to make it short. The idea is to present the generalization of Dirac's equation incorporating uh, colors. There's a special The quarks are endowed not only with half integer spin, but apparently they have another variable which takes on not two, but three values and they are exclusive. So uh, we'll try to include these colors as a three valued uh, variable into the equation. So we'll need uh, to uh, generalize the idea of uh, half integer spinners they'll have much more components. And then you will find the spinorial representation of the Z3 graded Lorentz algebra, because everything will become Z3 graded. Z3 graded means that uh, there is, instead of Z2 is based on two, there is one generator which is minus one, for example, and the square is one. Here, the generator is a cubic root of unity, and its square is also a cubic root of unity, but it's a different one. And finally, only the cube is equal to one. So we have three grades. Now, just to tell you that uh, what I will be exposing here is uh, based on the common work with Jerzy Lukierski from Poland, from Wroclaw University. And there are publications which are on archive. If uh, anybody is interested, you can look at them. So now let's see, this is just the illustration to, to tell you what it is about. It's about quarks, which are in a way, not really hypothetical because uh, the experimentally they give signs of existence, but they are uh, in, not like electrons or protons or other particles. They cannot be observed free. They are apparently they are inside the nucleons they are as small as electrons, if not smaller. So you see, for example, here, the nucleon is about a thousand times smaller than any atom. Now the nuclei are in the nucleon, they're even 10 times smaller, but quarks or electrons are even thousand times smaller than nuclei, than protons or neutrons. But what is also strange that Quarks cannot propagate freely. They can propagate freely inside the proton, but we cannot extract them. So there is something very strange. They cannot, uh, if they were just obeying Dirac's equation, like any fermions, like electrons, there would be no reason not to observe them freely. So, so probably there is something different in them. This is the confinement mystery. You see the deep in elastic scattering. I mean, when uh, physicists have very energetic electrons, they penetrate inside a nucleon, inside a proton or inside a neutron, and then they scatter. And the scattering image proves that there are some very small point like particles inside, but they cannot be extracted. They do not, they are free only inside, but not outside. So they cannot be direct observed and this is what I said so I pass to another slide okay this is just to uh, remind that there are three different kinds of elementary uh, forces one is electromagnetic force that we know well strong forces quarks interact with the strong forces and they carry this new uh, uh, new degree of freedom, which is called color. There are three different possible states. And there is there are weak interactions. So quarks interact with everything. They interact electromagnetically, weak and strong, while the electrons or other leptons like mu mesons, they do not see strong interaction. They do not have colors. They see only weak and electromagnetic interactions. Here is the image, and this is I would like to underline 
because the present knowledge, we have not all types of quarks. We have six different types of quarks, of which this type, there are three families and in two different states of quarks. So the, the family that is really well known is up and down. These quarks constitute neutrons and protons. And this, these are the most common ones. Then there are strange and strange and charm and top and bottom. These quarks are so heavy that they are observed only in very, very uh, energetic collisions. And usually we don't see them, only these ones. But there are three different families and three, and each family has two quark states. What is also interesting that we have these three colors and in quantum chromodynamics, quarks are considered like ordinary fermions, but endowed with, sorry, there's something. I'm not, yeah. So uh, they are endowed these colors and they, this is how they compose particles that are observable. A proton, a neutron, these are hyperons and so on. And only different colors cannot coexist. It is exactly like half integral spin of electron in, in any atom. If you have two electrons bes beside the spin, they have the same energy, the same magnetic number, the same uh, uh, um, angular momentum. So they cannot have the same spin. They must have two opposite spins. But here, if you have quarks inside a proton or a neutron, whatever you, you choose, they must have different colors. This is the, this new variable. It's like spin, but it takes on three values and not two. And as spin, you remember to, to um, describe this Z2 symmetry, that there are only two states of spin which cannot coexist. So is this plus or minus? Here, to, to describe three states, of course, the natural thing is Z3 grading and not Z2 grading. Now I come to the exper uh, to Dirac equation, how it was, it could have been discovered by Pauli. It was not, but this shows you how the new degree of freedom can impose some new symmetry. So after the discovery of spin of the electron, Pauli understood that one Schrodinger equation for one, power, for one wave function is not enough to describe these two different states. So this is why he proposed to describe the dichotomic spin variable by introducing a two component function, two functions, which are called now, they're called Pauli spinners. And of course, on these two component functions, you must have uh, Hermitian matrices that act upon because all uh, matter club or all quantum operators acting on states should be Hermitian in order to have real expectation values. So you know very well probably these are the three, this is the basis of three traceless Hermitian matrices. And they must be traceless because if you want to exponentiate, if you have the algebra of such things, uh, we want to have unitary representation. And there is another Hermitian, the fourth Hermitian matrix, two by two, which is just a unit matrix, but it is not traceless. So uh, the exponent will not have the term equal to one. The three Pauli matrices span the three-dimensional Lie algebra, which is the algebra of rotations. And they also span the Clifford algebra of three-dimensional Euclidean space. So now how Pauli uh, proposed first, he wrote the simplest Schrodinger-like equation. In Schrodinger uh, equation, you have to, uh, the energy is replaced by minus ih time derivative and momentum minus ih gradient. So the simplest 
Schrodinger like equation acting on this two component wave function would be will take energy just proportional to unit matrix, mass is proportional to unit matrix, and then momentum has it is a vector, but it has to act on two by on two component column. So we multiply it scalarly by sigma matrices, and this is another two by two operator, which is Hermitian. So fantastic, we have a linear equation, looks like Schrodinger equation for this two component spinner. Fine, but unfortunately, it is not Lorentz invariant. It does not obey the Lorentzian invariance because if we square such an equation, if you iterate it, it becomes diagonal. But then we have the relationship, you see there will be E squared, there will be momentum squared, multiplied by C squared. The mass will give mass squared, fantastic. But there will be a double product. And this double product destroys the Lorentz covariance because relativistic invariant is like this. E squared, this is the square of uh, pseudo scalar, this is a pseudo scalar product of a four vector, which is called four momentum, energy and momentum. In relativity, you have four momentum. And it's square, is constant, this is the mass square. But this equation, although it's very simple, does not obey the relativity requirement. This is not relativistic invariant. So in order to, you see, when you have something that is uh, different of squares, the natural thing is to think, well, you can, you can uh, produce it like a product of difference by a sum. If you have E plus P minus, uh, multiplied by E minus P, then you have E squared minus P squared. But how to do it? Well, if, in order to do it, we must introduce another another Pauli spinner and mix them up. You see, if we have Psi plus, which is a Pauli spinner with two, a column of two wave functions, but here the momentum acts on a minus and then E on minus has to, we have to have minus sign here, then by iteration we'll get, we'll get rid of this double product, you see? There will be no double product anymore if you put it on the other side. And as a matter of fact, this is what happens. If we iterate it, now both Psi plus and Psi minus will uh, obey the Klein-Gordon equation, which is, of course, it is Lorentz invariant. And of course, these two equations can be written in a more concise form. We introduce gamma zero, which is sigma three tensor, tensor rate with unit matrix. This is gamma Dirac's gamma zero. And uh, gamma K, the three remaining space components are obtained by tensorizing with I sigma two. Why we must put I here? Because this matrix is Hermitian, this should be anti-Hermitian because the squares should span the Minkowskian matrix. So the square of this will be one because sigma three is one. And the square of this sigma k square gives one, but this i will give minus one. So we'll have the proper uh, signature of Minkowskian space like this. So we have the so we have now created the Clifford algebra related with Minkowski metric tensor. The sigma matrices created, spent the Clifford algebra of Euclidean three-dimensional space. This gamma matrices of Dirac, they span Clifford algebra of Minkowski space. And of course the commutators give the generators of the Lorentz algebra. Now, as you 
you certainly notice that the price to pay for it was the introduction of minus mass, of negative mass, or of negative energy, it depends how you see it. But so this was the, the problem Pauli was scared of, but Dirac accepted it. And of course, he predicted the positrons, the, the electron is of mass, positive mass, but positron can be regarded upon as an electron with negative energy or negative mass. It's just the same. And they have been discovered, of course. So now relativistic invariance, the spinners, Pauli spinners that compose the Dirac spinner, they uh, under Lorentz transformations, they transform differently because there are two different uh, representations of SL2C group, which is covering group of the Lorentz group. And everything becomes, uh, sorry, everything becomes Lorentz invariant. Now, these two couple uh, Pauli equations, they can be written like this, and they are interpreted. This is called Dirac's equation. You have this Dirac spinner is a four component because psi plus and psi minus are Pauli spinners, which are two components. So now let us see, uh, you see how Z2 symmetry acts on these equations, on these states, because if you change spin, if spin changes sign and momentum changes sign, this is the same, the equation remains the same. And if mass changes sign, but psi plus goes to psi minus and psi minus to psi plus, again, it is invariant, you get the same equation. So you have Z2 cross Z2 group. One Z2 group is, this, is describing the half integral spin, spin up or spin down, the two exclusive states of an electron. And there is another Z2 symmetry that has been produced because we wanted to make it Lorentz invariant. The other Z2 symmetry is called charge conjugation. It is a symmetry between, between particles and antiparticles. So now let us see how the same thing can be done with colors and with Z3. So if we want to describe not only half integer spin, but also new variable that takes on three values. So what we, of course, what we could do, what is done currently in quantum chromodynamics is that we consider just three Dirac particles satisfying Dirac equation. And then we attribute colors to them. And, but now they have to interact by a potential in order to understand why they cannot propagate so the, uh, there is a special potential that is created, very strange one. Instead of decreasing with distance, it, increasing lin it incre increases linearly with distance. So the, the farther you go, the more the forces that push you together grow. That is why. But this, is, it, it, this theory works. It, it gives good predictions. But there is another possibility that you want to propose, which is to attribute colors not to Dirac spinners, but to give the colors to Pauli spinners. So then you'll have phi plus is a Pauli spinner. We will call it red. This one, chi plus, is blue. And this one is, psi plus, is this green. But you remember that all particles, even if they are Dirac particles, they have to have partners which are anti-particles. So we, we must have also particles that are anti-colors. So there are six other functions. We'll call them phi minus, phi minus one. This is a Pauli spinner, but corresponding to anti-color. Anti-color of red is called cyan, cyan. Anti-color of Kai who was, which was blue is yellow, and anti-color of green of psi is called magenta. These three colors, by the way, you know that the former colors, 
red, blue, and green. These are the colors of pixels you see on your screen or on your TV because they are additive. These colors add up. When you look at them, they add up. For example, red plus green will give you the impression of yellow. But you probably know, you probably observed that these three colors, C and yellow and magenta, they are used not in TV, but they are used in your printers because they are, you subtract them. The white page is white. And then when you put something, you subtract one of, of the real colors and then you get the anti-colors. So for example, if you subtract C and you'll get red from out of white. Okay, so now how we'll do We will follow the same uh, the same logic that produced Dirac equation out of Pauli equations. So, but now we'll have to incorporate not only Z2 cross Z2, but also Z3. So we'll have one Z2 for half integer spin, spin up, spin down. One Z2 for the fact that there are particles and antiparticles. And finally, Z3 symmetry which describes the, uh, the fact that we have three different colors. So all in all, the wave function now will have 12 components. Three times two times two is 12. The Dirac particle had four components, the Dirac spinner, now we'll have 12 components. So this is what I just pronounced. Let us see what kind of equation can we will follow the same logic as in Pauli from Dirac. So remember that when we pass from particle to antiparticle, from psi plus to psi minus, the mass parameter, mass, was changed to minus mass. Now we have not only minus, but we have also, we have also the generators of, uh, we'll call it J. J is just, the cubic root of unity, it is e to power two pi i over three. So each time we pass to another color, we have to multiply mass by j. And if pass even more than j square, and only after third step we'll have, we'll come back. So this is the, now this is the generalization of Dirac equation, but which takes into account not only particle antiparticle symmetry, but also the color symmetry. You see, we start with phi plus, red Pauli spinner. The mass is the same, the mass is positive, okay? But you have to go to the next color and to antiparticle. So the momentum acts on chi minus. Now we apply energy to chi minus. Now we have to change sign because chi minus is an antiparticle, but also we change color. So we have to employ also the generator of Z3. So here we have mass multiplied by minus J, but then you pass to another color and to particle. And so you see, you have to, we, have, we must do six such steps in order to come back to phi plus. From pi, phi plus to chi minus, from chi minus, to psi plus, from psi plus to phi minus, phi minus chi plus, and so and so. So you see, and we exhausted all six possibilities. The, it is Z2 cross Z3. And Z2 cross Z3, the simple product of Z2 by Z3 is Z6. So these are all, all six order uh, roots of unity. J, J square and one are third roots of unity, but if you multiply by minus one, you get six roots of unity. Okay, so this is the system we have to investigate. And I remind that this, this phi plus, phi minus, this, this are Pauli spinners. So each of them has two components. So these big things are 12 component. Now, this is just uh, to remind you what is what are the co uh, coefficients with mass and then we can write down 
the whole thing with six by six matrices. In fact, they are 12 by 12, right? Because they act on a 12 column vector, uh, on the column of 12 complex functions. But here we, behind each of these items is a two by two unit matrix. So this of course is 12 dimensional. And this is also 12 dimensional because each of these small matrices you see sigma p is a two by two matrix. But it is better to see it as a six by six block matrices. So now it's easy to see what is these matrices are of course can be obtained by as a tensor. This is just reminder that they are two by two matrices behind. And now we can sorry, yeah. This is another important feature that in order to diagonalize it, remember that the Dirac equations, once you square it, it gave you the proper Klein, Klein Gordon equation. Here it is not possible because we have this entanglement of six different wave functions with three colors, three anti colors. So, in order to get rid of all um, mixed of all combined uh, double products, we have to go to six to sixth power. And it is very interesting because the sixth power gives you something that looks exactly like a uh, Lorentzian invariant. You remember E squared, M squared, P squared, if you put squares here, this was the Klein-Gordon equation. So here it is, looks like, but it is sixth order. So it is not Lorentz invariant. But if you write it, if one writes it in this manner, which looks like a Lorentz invariant, but it's not, of course, then you see that it can be decomposed, that it is a product. This is a product of three different factors. And these factors, they look like Lorentz invariants. Look, this one is a Lorentz invariant. This is E squared minus P squared. This is fantastic. It's like, if you write that this is M squared, very good. This is a Lorentz invariant quantity, but it is multiplied by two other quantities, which are complex conjugate. And they look like Lorentz invariants, but they are not because they have this two possible roots, cubic roots of union, but they are conjugate and the whole, this gives you the real expression. So the idea is that probably behind this, there is a Z3 graded Lorentz group. One is a zero grade, this is grade one and grade two, and all three, if they act, then it, it becomes Lorentz invariant. Now, how much time do I have? Uh, Gleb. You are uh, until, um, until the- 10 past. Uh, 10 past. Uh, okay, so oh. about 20 minutes, fine. So now let us write all this in terms of we see, you remember there were these two matrices. One was for uh, mass and another was for momentum. So if you, int one, if we introduce these two traceless matrices, three by three, we call it B and we call it Q3. Then the, this 12 by 12 mass matrix can be written like this. B tensorite with sigma three because there's one and minus one and the unit matrix two by two. And the momentum was Q3, it was like this. There was sigma one because they were off diagonal and there was this little two by two momentum operators with Pauli matrices. So now uh, it's interesting that these two matrices, they are both, this is traceless and this is traceless of course. If you take the enveloping algebra, they generate the Lie algebra, which is uh, now, this is the equation, how it looks like now with this tensor products. This is the unit matrix. This is the matrix that you saw, which is one minus one minus one, J minus J and J squared minus J squared. And this is also this off diagonal matrix. 
So now, in order to make it again, like Dirac equation, we'll put this on the left hand side and the mass on the right hand side. And there is still something that is not very pleasant because the mass is not a unit operator. We would like to make it proportional to 12 by 12 unit operator. But this is simple. We have to multiply everything from the left by co conjugate matrices, B dagger and sigma three. Then you'll have one here, unit matrix here. And this will be just form. This is what we get. Now it looks like exactly like Dirac equation because this is can be called gamma zero. This can be called gamma i. And this is just mass operator. Fantastic. Sorry. Yeah. So this is like standard Dirac operator. The only difference is that only six power is uh, proportional to 112. So this is the diagonalization of the system because now each of these components satisfies the same equation. All 12 components satisfy the same equation. But unfortunately, this equation is not Lorentz invariant but we'll show that it is invariant under a generalization of Lorentz group, which is the Z3 graded Lorentz group. So you see, this is exactly like Dirac equation, but the problem is, sorry. Of course, uh, one can say there are many different choices the problem is why we choose this one. It depends because uh, we choose one of the generators, which was J. We could have chosen J square. Then there will be different matrices would appear and we'll have a different representation of the same uh, color Dirac equation. Now the question is how much, how, how many such Dirac equations are possible because there are eight different, there are eight different generators, you see this six matrices, traceless matrices, traceless Hermitian matrices, uh, they all span the space of, uh, but this is not complete. You have still two other traceless matrices which are diagonal, but we, we, we shall give them grades. Sorry, I'll come back a little bit. So these three, you see, they have the same shape as matrices. They will be given grade one. Their Hermitian conjugates will be given grade two and grade zero will be, yeah, grade zero will be two diagonal matrices, but traceless. One will be called B, another B dagger, Hermitian. Now, this, uh, they span a very interesting ternary algebra. I will not, you see, these combinations, the skew Z, Z3 commutators are zero, and the anti commutator, see, the, you have three different permutations, and they are all proportional to one, but this is. This is the tensor, one j j squared. So this is this is called ternary Clifford algebra. And of course, you have the same for complex uh, for Hermitian conjugates with the Hermitian conjugate of this spinorial metric. Or these are the two matrices that uh, were not enumerated. So we have eight different generators, which generate SU3 algebra. This is a base, basis of SU3 algebra. And this basis was already studied by Victor Katz in uh, 25 years ago. 
So we have this symmetry SU3. You see, this is interesting because we started with Z3. We produce an equation. This equation naturally introduced these two matrices. These two matrices introduced the Lie algebra. And then we find that the Z3 generated the symmetry, which is SU3, which is fine. Now, the problem is that we cannot produce the uh, Clifford algebra with these gamma matrices. We have this gamma zero and gamma K, but they do not anti-commute like Dirac matrices. No good. So the problem is how to implement the action of Lorentz group on these matrices. There are only two, but there are many other. So how many, we don't know. Don't know yet. Now, this is the equation which is written now. The gamma matrices are like this. And let us try to introduce the generators of Lorentz group which will act on them. Of course, these matrices are, you remember, they are 12 by 12 matrices. So the generators of Lorentz algebra, they have to be also, because they will commute to them, so they, we, have, we must take them from 12 by 12 matrices. Now I'll show, uh, I'll speed a little bit. Yeah. So let us start with this kind of commutators. Gamma J, gamma K, gamma J, gamma zero. And of course, these are new matrices, which should be interpreted. These are the generators of ordinary space rotations. And these are generators of Lorentz boosts, which mix up time and space. Now, this you see that they, these generators that we have produced, they satisfy the exactly what they should satisfy. This is the Lorentz algebra, ordinary. But the problem is that if you take farther commutators, then you get something more. In fact, by commuting more and more, we get new generators, which we called, you see, with Q2, with Q1, and so forth. So finally, we get the following graded group. Yeah, uh, graded Lorentz algebra. Uh, well, I'll skip the construction. I'll show you the result. The result is that you have the same commutation relations like with ordinary Lorentz algebra, but they are graded. So you see the grades add up. For example, if you take zero grade with zero grade, here you'll have zero grade two. But if you have something that has Z3 grade one with Z3 grade one, it will be, give you Z3 grade two. Two and two will give you one. Zero and one will give one, and so forth. So these things are taken modulo three. These are the other. So this is the full set of this uh, graded Lorentz group. Uh, sorry, graded Lorentz algebra. These are the generators of ordinary algebra. And these two are generators of grade one part and grade two part. This is a subalgebra. These things are not subalgebras because they map when you take commutators here, they put you here, commutators here, put you here, like it should be with Z through grading. But the whole thing is an algebra. The whole thing is a Lie algebra. And now the problem is how they act on gammas, on our uh, colored Dirac matrices. And now the most important things comes. We will, in order to simplify notations, the all possible gamma matrices will be uh, constructed like this. You have one of these three by three matrices, which are generators, one of the Pauli matrices and sigma mu, which can be one or zero. Zero is the unit matrix and one, two, three are Pauli matrices. Good. So now we start to expand. Of course, there are many, many different commutators to be taken. 
I don't show you what what is the result, but the result is we start with these two. Remember these two matrices, gamma zero and gamma i, was what we got when we constructed this colored Dirac equation. These were these two 12 by 12 matrices and only one equation. But the problem is that if we commute them with uh, different generators, we'll get, we'll create more and more similar matrices. But what is amazing that after all these commutations, you see like this, these are the rules. This is with K0, but we have to commute them with K1, J1, and so forth in order to produce more and more. These are Lorentz doublets because we have, if you have two, three and eight, two, uh, they will be produced from eight, three and two, two because they transform into each other. And finally, you see, we have already a doublet because we have matrix and the matrix that is obtained by interchanging the color terms in the first, but they, they all represent the same equation. And finally, the final result is the following. That of course, uh, the generators Q3 and Q3 bar were employed in the construction of Lorentz um, generators. B, they also, they appear in the first matrix. So simple, we are in the combinatorics. So this is at least one combinatorics here. We see that all gamma matrices that can be produced are as follows. We have to choose, this can be chosen from uh, A should not be equal to B. They are chosen from this set from this set no three and no uh, four five six seven eight yeah no three and no uh which one this one this is missing okay anyway what is first of all we see that uh, we can have as many as 42 different realizations of this thing but after completing the all commutators out of this 42, we get only six possibilities, six gammas and six gamma tilde, which are the conjugates. This means that there are only six, six possible different quarks and six possible antiquarks. This is very interesting because we have exactly what was predict, we predict of course, it is prediction into the past and not in the future, because it was it is already known, but we somehow we constructed it from the imposing the colors on the Dirac equation, generalizing it, making it Z3, uh, Z3 uh, graded. We see that it can be done, this Lorentz, uh, the Lorentz invariance imposes new degrees of freedom and these new degrees of freedom are exactly six exactly like this what is observed that it is not only you have not only color quarks but you have six different color quarks three families and in each family you have uh, two flavors that they say up and down charm and uh, strangeness and top and bottom so you have six and of course anti-quarks against six so this is the result which is, came from imposition of uh, Lorentz invariance. And of course, this Lorentz group is interesting in itself because it is a Z3 graded covering of Lorentz and with, with three different items. But I think I will stop here because the time is over. So thank you for your patience. Thank you, dear uh, Richard. I take the, the turn after Gleb yeah. uh, to be the chairman, as asked by Gleb. Uh, are there questions? And this, uh, 
presentation. No. I don't know how to, I can see. Ah. I don't have the... Can you see me better? Yeah, now I can see you. Okay. Are there questions? Well, I have uh, small questions. Uh, your sectors are in uh, in number three because you you uh, grade by Z three. Yeah. Uh, is it related by your uh, to your ternary uh, previous work? Yes, yes, yes. Of course, it is inspired by it. Yeah. Ah, but, okay. Okay. Yeah. This is uh, yeah yeah because uh, we started this ternary uh algebras but finally uh, here it is it is simpler because there's the variables are not uh, z3 graded the variables are just complex functions and complex matrices what is graded are the it is grading comes because the matrices are different you have different okay. uh, any uh, question in more question uh, remark or comment No, people so, are tired. People are tired. <laughs> okay. Yes, you, yes. you can show the archive uh, if you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's it is of course. Okay. It uh, anyway. Your slides are in. Yeah, the, yeah. The slides are accessible. There's are, much more. Are on the program. And there, are, of course, there are papers published. So I take the opportunity to, uh, for my uh, closing, uh, Please send your, your slides as, uh, as soon as possible so that we can put uh, them on the program in IHS. And uh, I thank you for making talks. I thank you for attending. Uh, 